today, uh, we will be hearing from Dr. Genevieve Bichard. Uh, Dr. Bichard is the Hydrographer General of Canada and also Director General for the Canadian Hydrographic Service with Fisheries and Ocean Canada. Um, she has joined CHS at an exciting time when there are profound changes in the world of hydrography as we go digital. She had previously held positions with the Government of Canada at the Canada Centre for Remote Sensing, the Geologic Survey of Canada, and the Meteorological Service of Canada. Dr. Bouchard was recently elected as the new chair of the International Hydrographic Organization Council. She also serves as vice chair of the United States Canada Hydrographic Commission, vice chair of the Arctic Regional Hydrographic Commission. So obviously someone who is going to be able to present some amazing opportunities uh, uh, of what's going on in the mapping world. And I know that, that she is very excited um, with the work that is going on and what she is going to present today. So um, Dr. Bouchard, if, if you would like to uh, take the floor and, and uh, present our keynote today, we, we'd be excited to hear from you. Okay, thank you very much. I don't know if you, if I'm supposed to turn on the camera or not. Um, is it better if I turn it off or is it okay if it's on? Oh, you can have it on. It looks like we have great connection right now. Okay, excellent. Um, and just let me know if we need to change that. I do want to thank you and the organizers of the conference for inviting me to speak and at the same time congratulate you on being able to bring together such a uh, such a great conference in a virtual uh, world. So uh, congratulations for that. And with that, do want to say that as I speak to you from the traditional unceded territory of the peoples of the Algonquin Anishinaabeg Nation, I, I would like to acknowledge that today in Canada marks the first National Day for Truth and Reconciliation. The Government of Canada created this federal holiday to ensure that the history of residential schools was not forgotten. And I would like to take a moment to recognize and commemorate the legacy of residential schools in this country and to think of those who never returned home and those who did but were burdened with trauma that would span generations to come. And I just wanted to take a few moments today to, to remember that um, before going into my uh, talk. Um, if we go to the next slide, and um, I guess I'm a big history fan, and when I was preparing for the talk today, I, I thought it would be fitting to talk about going back to the Canadian Hydrographic Service roots, which actually started in the Great Lakes, um, even though um, surveying and charting had been happening in Canada for centuries. Um, it had been done by the um, Royal Navy, the UK Royal, Royal Navy, and so um, we, uh, as Canadians, really started surveying in Georgian Bay in the 1880s. And the Georgian Bay survey was established in 1883 following a, a tragic uh, loss of life due to grounding. And um, that eventually led to the creation of the Canadian Hydrographic Service. Um, interestingly enough, even though we started um, doing work in the Great Lakes, and I really enjoyed uh, the logo that you had on your slide for this year's conference, which so shows the uh, density of data, and we can still see that there are parts of the Great Lakes that are not surveyed, and we're very conscious of that. So incredibly enough, after all these years, there's still a lot of work to do. And um, so, the um I, I think that um this is why we need a program like lake, lake bed 2030 so what i wanted to do today is talk a little bit about the digital transformation that is happening in the world of hydrography and what we're doing at uh, the canadian hydrographic service what that means for us and then what that means for our contributions to lake bed 2030. so if we go to the next slide um because obviously with the start of uh, the Canadian Hydrographic Service, 
based very much on safety of navigation. I would say that our core work and, and a lot of the things that we are known for is supporting safe navigation through the pr provision of uh, standardized hydrographic information, charts, nautical publications. We also are known for the work we do around the maritime limits and boundaries. And essentially, um, we, we work closely with, with the marine sector. More and more, however, I think that our information and data, including seabed uh, data, is used for much more than that. And that's a little bit the premise behind uh, my talk today. If we go to the next slide, um, this is this illustrates um, some of the new standards that the International Hydrographic Organization is rolling out with partners or partner organizations, the World Meteorological Organization. Uh, and the organizations responsible for uh, aids to navigation and a couple of others. Um, this shows these different standards within a marine environment. And ultimately, the vision is that a mariner that's navigating on uh, waters will be able to access all of this different type of data in standards that allow them to use these data in an interoperable way, which doesn't exist today. And um, so you can see that a mariner could, beyond the charts and the weather that they're getting now, could also possibly access uh, information about marine protected areas, could possibly also access data about the whales that are going by or other types of data that we can't imagine today and actually access them in one platform where the data is integrated. And that's the vision for where the world of hydrography is going with uh, other uh, key partners that produce data on, on the water. Um, this is th this move to, um, to the S100 world is creating a huge digital transformation for hydrographic offices like the Canadian Hydrographic Service, because it means that we need to move from paper to digital. And right now for us, it constitutes a, a big challenge because that means that we have to get our databases in order. It means that a number of our charts that are only available in paper form have to be transformed and the data has to be moved into a digital format. And um, this is tremendously important for uh, activities like Lake, Lake Bed 2030 and for two reasons. First of all, it means that as this data becomes available, we're going to be able to offer services that are new, that are exciting, but also that will create a demand for more data. It will also create a demand for near real-time data. And we could imagine a world now where instead of waiting 10 years for, or even longer for a chart to be updated, that mariners will be ac able to access data that is the most recent um, following a new collection of data. It also means that we will be looking for more data in more in different areas because the gaps that we now have in in as we navigate will become apparent very quickly when uh, mariners or others want to access this data and so it really opens up the need to collect not just data in the traditional way but also to seek other sources of data to supplement the data that that hydrographic offices are currently um, collecting. So that's the context within which we're working. And this is not just in Canada or in the US, but it is globally. Um, if we move to the next slide, and I talked about this earlier, although a lot of the way that we look at our processes and the way that we uh, look at the products and services that we offer are there uh, to support safe navigation, I think we're seeing more and more uh, the use of our data in, in much broader, much other, in other spheres of, um, and um, part of our challenge is to make sure that those users understand 
the power of the data that we've got and make use of it. And wanted to highlight here three examples uh, of uh, where our data has been used by a broad group. Um, the middle example is one that comes back to uh, work that was done in 2020 uh, by um, Titan Maritime on the East Coast, where on our charts you could see that there was a man man-made um, obstruction and it turned out to be ghost gear that they were able to go in and clean up and that was a very powerful use of some of our data. Um, on the right just wanted to highlight um, some of our data um, used uh, around Lake Ontario um, for uh, monitoring water levels during high water events in 2017 and 2019. Uh, and finally um, one of the things that we're looking at is being able, as we provide much more um, efficient, in a much more efficient way, data about currents, um, that this could allow uh, vessels and ships to adjust their routes and adjust their speeds in order to be more efficient and therefore reduce energy consumption and um, uh, contribute to reducing um, global warming. If we move on to the next slide then, um, I forgot to mention on the previous slide, but there's a reference here as well, is um, in three years ago, we released all of the data that the Canadian Hydrographic Service had its, in its database. This is um, online, uh, it's open. Uh, you can go in and uh, look at it through um, the open data portal of the Government of Canada. And then last summer in 2020, we released the 10 meter. So three years ago, we released the 100 meter data. And uh, last year we opened up a pilot with the 10 meter data. And this is what we call the NONA, the non-navigational data. And it is now open uh, for those who want to go in and browse and explore. Um, what we're hoping with this is to really get folks using our data for a variety of uses, but also this now allows us to, to, to look at where we've got gaps. And um, strangely enough, when I started with the Canadian Hydrographic Service three years ago, I asked the question, okay, well, I know we haven't finished Canada because we haven't. We still have unsurveyed parts of Canadian waters, including in the Great Lakes. Um, so I said, well, how, what would it take for us to finish Canada? How much time would it take? Um, what would it cost? Um, how could we pull together a, a plan to finish doing Canada uh, so that we don't have to wait 200 years to have it done? And um, I, I wasn't able to get an answer. So the, the, the first thing, the first step to be able to do a plan is to actually look at where your gaps are. So right now uh, we've We've just finalized or we are finalizing the methodology that we're going to use to do our gap analysis and it will be based on the data that we've got in our NONA um, services that you can uh, access. Uh, and then once that's done, uh, we can start uh, planning. Part of the challenge, of course, is that we have the need to return to certain places to resurvey for uh, dredging purposes, for safety purposes, uh, for change detection purposes, uh, understanding that there are large areas where there is, uh, where we still haven't gone to survey. So a big challenge for us. If we move on to the next slide. Um, very proud, a um, couple of, about four years ago, um, we were uh, received some short-term funding, five-year funding, to um, modernize and accelerate surveying and we use some of these this funding to to uh, really complete the lidar coverage on the canadian side in the great lakes and we we're pleased to do that our uh, our us colleagues had of course much more lidar coverage on their side of the great lakes so uh, with with this new data um, which we've is incorporated and is offered in our nona data uh, offerings um, we, we felt that we were finally uh, contributing our own share uh, of the data that was needed. It's valuable nearshore data, as indicated here, uh, multiple use for it. So I invite you, if you have an interest, to uh, to go in and look. And it's 
it's been shared as well with our colleagues from other federal departments for their own use. Um, so, uh, for example, uh, after the, the flooding in uh, 2019, some of this data was used to look at damage along the shores of Lake Ontario. If we move on to the next slide, I want to use this as a, as a lead in to discussing the importance of uh, our collaboration with our US colleagues. Um, we have, uh, we share a lot of boundary waters, including Great Lakes, Lake Ontario. And uh, so under the International Hydrographic Organization, uh, we work together in the US Canada Hydrographic Commission. And it's a great place for us to uh, first um, collaborate on uh, ensuring that mariners and other users have access to harmonized products. We uh, really look at the charting that needs to be done and, and share the work. Um, and we also um, get together to, to exchange on testing uh, of technologies and on planning essentially. And as we move to a digital world, uh, one of the challenges will be to ensure that digital services that are offered um, are seamless as folks navigate uh, between our two countries. Um, if we move on to the next slide. Uh, so this is an example of the work that we've done under the US-Canada uh, Hydrographic Commission. As we move to a digital world, um, we are we need to move to a gridded scheme, which is already done on land, but obviously uh, on water, um, strangely enough, uh, under the International Hydrographic Organization, there is not a single unified standard scheme for gridding that exists yet. Those discussions are underway. And uh, so for that reason, uh, we've been working with our US counterparts to really work out what does it mean. And it's quite important because we don't use the same units of measure in the two countries. Um, and yet we really do need to make this as seamless as possible. So um, this is the kind of work and the kind of discussions that, that uh, are um, that are that we undergo in, in the commission. If we move on to the next slide. Um, we also exchange on innovation and our uh, colleagues at NOAA have been testing a number uh, of quite exciting uh, technologies, including using the uncrewed surface vessels. Um, I wanted to highlight here some work that we've done in Canada. Um, with COVID, we've really, um, particularly last year, we had to first consider what were the critical surveys that needed done. And so we had folks out in the field throughout COVID, uh, but we really focused on those areas where we needed to uh, support safety of navigation. But at the same time, we used this as an opportunity to uh, do surveys and minimize our footprint in the field. And so we did it in a couple of ways. This is a, a testing that we did in Lake Superior um, and the vessel was controlled uh, as this indicates, I think it was controlled from Ireland. Um, we got some quite interesting results uh, there and the work is continuing this year. Um, we picked Lake Superior knowing uh, that we had some quite old data and that we had lots of gaps in the, in, in the lake and we were quite pleased with, with the results. Um, we also um, did some remote surveying elsewhere in the St. Lawrence, not with a uncrewed surface vessel, but uh, we work uh, very closely with our colleagues in Coast Guard. Um, and uh, so we actually had, had fewer hydrographers on board uh, the Coast Guard launches and had hydrographers um, directing the equipment from shore and uh, again to try to reduce the footprint in the field. If we move on, so the reason this, uh, and I probably won't come as a surprise to anyone in, uh, um, in the conference, uh, but the there's a huge amount of interest in aut autonomy and autonomous um, and uncrewed um, 
surface vehicles. And the reason for that is that we can, with these, we can really augment what we can do on board ships. We can, uh, and I saw that there was a discussion on also the, the zero carbon footprint of um, surveying. I see you have a talk about that later this afternoon. Um, there's huge interest in being able to use these to augment what we can do and do it with a zero carbon footprint. So um, what we're testing and what other hydrographic organizations are testing is being brought together at the IHO so that we can really uh, maximize uh, the efficiencies, share on the learning, and um, the private sector is quite advanced in being able to uh, to help us uh, along uh, our goals, which is to map the world uh, by 2030 or the oceans. Um, and, th and then this is, once this comes together, and I mentioned this before, uh, looking at integrating different sources of data. Um, here, we're looking at the integration of uh, really high quality data, LIDAR, multi-beam. Um, but I think uh, particularly for um, the lake beds 2030 um, initiative, we really need to be looking at other sources, even if they're not as high quality, particularly third party data in order to at least get a first, first cut at what the seabed is like. Um, if we move on to the next slide. Uh, so just wanted to share that we are continuing work on the Great Lakes. Um, there are areas where we need to go and repeat simply to support, uh, as I mentioned, dredging and commercial navigation, um, ensuring that the waterways are clear. Uh, but we're also seeing growth around the Great Lakes in particular with cruise ship activity and this will require um, data to ensure uh, that ports as ports small ports change uh, develop that to ensure that uh, we can support safety uh, but beyond that we are continuing our work in the uh, national marine conservation area in lake superior uh, with our autonomous vessel um, but it's not enough um, and this is why I think the next site speaks to it. This is why um, we are strong supporters of the crowdsource bathymetry, which essentially is looking at partners to help us collect the data that's needed. Um, the IHO um, has been working on uh, providing guidelines for uh, this kind of activity. Um, and the U.S. has been chairing the working group now for several years. Canada is a co-chair of that same working group. And uh, the intent is to provide guidance and also make it easy uh, for folks to contribute data. Um, the, and in the same way that Seabed 2030 and uh, I'm sure Lake Bed uh, 2030 as well, uh, have been trying to collect and make available data that has already been collected. Um, this is also something that we've been uh, inviting folks to, to contribute. Uh, but the next step is to collect new data where we've got gaps. And there um, we can turn to uh, trusted partners, um, ferries, uh, cruise ships, um, other ships that can collect data um, that can help contribute to filling the gaps. And uh, a second piece of that um, is uh, trying to uh, really promote uh, community-based hydrography, uh, arming communities that are interested in collecting data, particularly where we're not collecting it, um, near marinas or, or other areas. Um, that arming the folks in the community to collect and use the data and we're we've got some ideas uh, of how this can be done we've tested it with our friends in academia uh, in the arctic um, and it, it here i'm showing a west coast example where the canadian hydrographic service used uh crowdsourced data 
to help prioritize surveys um, in uh, inland waters. Um, however, uh, we'd like to do more of this, and we'd like to do more of this around the Great Lakes. Um, we could see uh, possibilities with some of the uh, indigenous communities as well. Uh, I know in BC, um, there we've been in discussion to to pull together a program where uh, some of the indigenous communities interested in the data in regards to fisheries and in regards to small crafts uh, are interested in collecting. And uh, there are um, small, uh, there is equipment that can be used for that. So if I move on to the next slide, which I think is my concluding slide, um, my last slide, okay. Um, the last bit that I want to talk about is, is dissemination of the data. Obviously, this all relies on having data that is in a standard format um, and where the metadata is very clear. Um, but we were very pleased in December of 2020 to um, release uh, surface currents at low resolution, um, but near real time. And um, again, this is something that is available through open data, but our marine spatial data infrastructure is something that we've pulled together um, at the Canadian Hydrographic Service to be able to bring different data together and, and visualize it. And um, this is done uh, specifically to help support uh, the non-navigational users of our data and um, allows us to visualize how different data can be used. And if you go in and look at, at the surface currents um, the models that are running behind these uh, are global models and you can actually see the currents for all of Canada, uh, including in parts of the Great Lakes. And we are currently working now on delivering a service with high res current data that would be available for ports and mariners, uh, again, for safety. Uh, but this gives you a, a preview of what that might look like. Um, and this should be, uh, this This is surface currents, but it could be any other type of data. It could be bathymetry, it could be water level, well, this includes, it could be water levels, it could be all the different types of data that we I was showing in my S100 diagram. So I think in conclusion, um, where I'd like to stop is the world of hydrography and ourselves are working to uh, implement these this, the world of S100 standards, this, these standards allow data to be used and visualized together if needed. Um, I've only showed examples here of single um, layers of data, but you could, you could actually superimpose them. And um, in order to be able to, um, to, to, to uh, uh, deliver those services, um, we're going to need more data and we're going to need better coverage. And, and, that's, uh, and that can't be done alone. I think we need to do that collectively. Um, so I would stop there and ask if there are any questions. I think the last slide was just a thank you slide. Great. There, Thanks, so Genevieve. That was, that was fantastic. Um, I, I really appreciated seeing that overview. And you, you had mentioned uh, in the talk early on about the the, the uh, what I'm calling smart shipping routes, taking all these new data to create better options for mariners. And so building out on that, do you see uh, do you see a bigger opportunity then for the, the smart ship in terms of the maritime trade routes becoming more of a, a realized player in terms of transportation of goods and cargo because we have better information like this? So uh, absolutely, that's a great question. I think there's different aspects to that. Uh, first of all, there's the whole aspect of autonomous ships and they can't happen without data. And so, um, and I, I, I think, and that's already happening. You, I mean, if Norway um, and uh, Finland both have uh, autonomous ships now that are available. Uh, Finland has a ferry and Norway is using autonomous ships to transport cargo along its coast. Um, and there's a huge amount of interest in the private sector and the IHO has a working group 
to and to make sure that we understand the data that the autonomous ships will need. But that will bring some efficiencies. Uh, and I think there's a lot of potential for these autonomous ships in the Great Lakes because you could see that uh, they could be used to carry smaller loads around the Great Lakes and and, and um, so there, there's a potential there. There is also, and there's the IMO um, earlier this year actually declared that they wanted to really try to reduce their carbon footprint, the, sh the carbon footprint of shipping. And, um, you know, if you're looking, if you're able to look at um, at currents in particular, winds, a couple of the other things that impact your ship. The other thing that uh, we are expecting will be helpful is how ports can communicate with ships and let them give them better information about timing, about when they can actually uh, go to the berth and unload, and that could allow them to adjust also their speed. So there's huge amounts of efficiency that can be gained with the right kind of data. So I, I'm a strong believer of that. Oh, that's exciting. I it, that's what got me thinking that. So I'm, um, I, I'm hopeful that that's what we see in the next decade or or sooner. So, um, we've gotten a couple of calls uh, or a couple of questions in on the chat, and we still have a couple of minutes here. So, um, there there's uh, there there's some interest, and this is from Derek Niles with with uh, Orange Marine and developing um, the crowdsource bathymetry solutions. Um, the idea of how do we engage uh, other organizations? How do we, where, where do people who have some ideas and, and some information with crowdsourced information, how can they contribute? How can they, how can they be part of this if they don't know how? So I think there's a couple of ways, but the probably a good starting point is with the IHO crowdsourced bathymetry working group. Um, I failed to mention, and I should have, that uh, the U.S. Um, hosts the IHO, um, the IHO, I should remember what the actual acronym is, the acronym is DCDB, but the IHO Digital Bathymetry Database, I think, it's, it's, it's an international database, and folks who want to contribute uh, crowdsourced bathymetry can contact them and uh, if the data is, is deemed of sufficient quality they'll take it in uh, but I would uh, but Jennifer Jenks at the IHO at the IHO DCDB in Boulder and she's with NOAA it, it chairs the group and so um, I think maybe the easiest would be if they're interested that they can contact us at CHS info which is seen shown right there and then because I know that in the working group industry as well as hydrographic organizations participate because the the working group is about making sure that we have the tools but also uh, most recently at their recent meeting they developed uh, some communication material to try to promote the importance of crowdsourced bathymetry with a number of the parts of the marine sector so i think that would be a good starting point so you're welcome to write to us at chs CHS info and we'll redirect you to the right person. Great, thank you. And I, there was a, another question about where released uh, bathymetric survey data can be accessed. And is that the link at the bottom of this slide in terms of uh, the charts.gc.ca? Um, so the there's two things. It depends what the use is for. Um, there's, I've mentioned the IHO, DCDB, um, Digital Bathymetric Database, uh, that you can go to look at worldwide data that's available. And our NONA data, the NONA 100 is also available there. NONA 10 is a bit dense, so it's better to access it. But I, I think the starting point is to go and look on our NONA site, which is on one of the other links earlier in the presentation, and the presentation will be made available to, to participants. I think that would be the other place to go in. And then if you need something more, then you can contact us at one of those these two. But the starting point is the NONA site because you can actually go in and see what data is available. Great, thank you. So, um, I'm, I'm, do we have any other questions from the audience? I, We've got 
just a minute or two, and then we'll transition to the the first presentation. Um, but to me, very exciting, and and seeing these synergies of the the high resolution mapping, the the, the uncrewed vessel opportunities, the delivery to the maritime trade industry, and short shipping routes and efficiencies gained with all this information will help us not not only create better opportunities, but just, a, a, I think, a more sustainable Great Lakes for the future. So very exciting. So I, if, I'm going to say thank you so much for, for your thank talk. Today. Thank you. And if I could say, just in closing, sorry, but with all of these innovations, you know, having more people that can contribute having the ability to do automated surveys. I'm now hoping that we can actually do a plan to finish Canada. Um, before it was something that seemed insurmountable, but I think now we're at the cusp of having what we need to do our plan. 